The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today, as you can see on the screen, we're going to be looking at the roles and responsibilities that registered charities have when it comes to protecting young people and vulnerable beneficiaries. Um, we're going to be looking at some of the obligations they might have through some uh, governance standards and external conduct standards, but most importantly, we're going to be looking at some of the practical ways uh, and, and bits and pieces that charities can do to, uh, to achieve these aims. My name is Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education uh, section. Uh, joining me today are uh, Ian and Julia, and they're from our compliance team. Um, hi to both of you. Give a wave. Great to catch up. How are you both? Doing well, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity uh, to present a webinar on what we see as being a very important topic, safeguarding. Um, and thank you to those people who've joined the webinar. Um, a lot of registered charities, I'm sure, um, looking to understand their obligations for safeguarding. Uh, just, yeah, thanks for the introduction. My name's Ian Parry. I'm a Senior Manager in Compliance, and I'm joined by my colleague, Julia Beale. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, Thank you to both of you for joining us. Before we get into things, as always, and I'm going to put my quick speaking voice on, uh, I'm going to get through a little bit of um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you've got any troubles with the audio, uh, if you're here today, you can try listening through the uh, through your phone. Um, call the number listed in uh, in the email uh, that you'll have received upon sign up, and there'll be an access code there, and you can uh, listen in that way. Um, we've got some colleagues today, Matt and Guth, who are going to be answering some questions in the background. So feel free to type in a question or two if you wish through the GoToWebinar uh, interface there, and uh, they'll be uh, zooming through some, some answers as we go through. Uh, we'll try and answer all the questions that come through. If we don't, um, there will be a, a chance for you to send an email to us, education at acnc.gov.au and we'll be able to help you out uh, through through that as well. Um, now, we've got our slides, obviously, you can probably see us. Uh, so our, our, our faces are, are here as well, we've got our cameras on. So you can switch between different views depending on what device you're on. You might want to click a mouse, you might want to slide from one side to the other. Uh, however you wish to view, you can. Uh, we're recording this webinar, the slides and the recording are going to be available up on our site uh, at some stage in the next day or so. We'll also send an email out to everyone who registered today to give them a link uh, to the recording, to some other resources uh, and some bits and pieces. We might mention some of those website links and all that during today's webinar. If we do, we will uh, drop them into the uh, to the chat uh, as we go along um, as well. Um, finally, uh, we really would like to grab some feedback from you uh, if, if you wish. Um, there's a little survey at the end of proceedings today, take literally 30 seconds. Um, if you wanted to answer a couple of questions, that would be great. We've also got some handouts too, which are um, available through the uh, GoToWebinar um, interface as well. Uh, there's some various bits and pieces and templates uh, and, and other stuff uh, linked to safeguarding. So all that done, hit the button, go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, what are we doing today? We, uh, we will start just looking at very quickly at um, uh, the idea of what is safeguarding, who are vulnerable people and what the charity's obligations are. Uh, where the, look, the real nitty gritty of today is going to be looking at the, the issues, um, addressing them, managing the risks, uh, all the bits and pieces that your charity can do um, to fulfil its responsibilities in this area. Um, you know, to look after young people or vulnerable beneficiaries that your charity uh, may have contact with. Um, we'll look at, as part of this policies, practice internal controls, um, which form a key part of, of this sort of work. There's a couple of case studies that we'll, we'll throw in there as well uh, as we go along. So let's go. Safeguarding and vulnerable people. What's safeguarding? Safeguarding is protecting the welfare and human rights of people connected to your work. Um, it's a vital part of your charity's primary sort of duty of care. It refers specifically or particularly, sorry, to the protection of people that might be at risk of, say, abuse or neglect or maybe exploitation. Those who we might refer to or who might be referred to as vulnerable people or vulnerable beneficiaries. 
Um, there's a bit of a, a, a definition of vulnerable people and vulnerable, uh, vulnerable be beneficiaries. Um, they enjoy the charities who work with or have contact with vulnerable people or beneficiaries. They really have some extra responsibilities, don't they? Thanks, Chris. That, that's right. Um, so while all people must be protected from harm, there's additional legislative and ethical considerations for protecting vulnerable people, and I'll chat about that a little bit. So regarding vulnerable people or beneficiaries, the focus is often on the safeguarding of children and young people, uh, but it's important to consider the safeguarding needs of children and charities. Um, but they should also, charities should also be mindful that vulnerable people can include other groups that are considered vulnerable. So, yeah, often, and it's it's often something that we see in practice as well, that a lot of beneficiaries will be children, but charities yeah. should be mindful uh, that the definition of vulnerable people or beneficiaries is broader. I'm happy to run through some other categories uh, that, yeah, that this, would this include is vulnerable is people or beneficiaries. So, things oh, such as seniors, so, yeah. uh, people with impaired intellectual or physical functions, yep. people with a low socioeconomic background, people who are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, people who are not native speakers of the local language, um, as well as people with low levels of literacy or education. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that's quite topical at the moment, um, there's been a little bit of focus on modern slavery laws. So people subject to modern slavery, which involves human exploitation and control, such as forced labour, debt bondage, human trafficking and child labour. Yeah, yeah. So going on to the next slide, um, vulnerable people is not only limited to a charity's beneficiaries or the users of its services, uh, it spans much wider um, and can include a charity's staff, volunteers and people in third parties or partners. Um, especially when you are perhaps working in an overseas country, um, that's often a situation where staff can find themselves in vulnerable situations and charities should ensure Staff and volunteers working overseas have access to suitable housing, food, insurance, medical services and communications yeah. and establish an emergency plan for staff and volunteers working in conflict zones or other high risk locations. So it's important also to remember that the vulnerability in question might be permanent and ongoing or it could be temporary and staff need to plan, uh, charities need to plan for all those circumstances. Uh, and it leads to an important point. Um, that a charity's ability to recognise vulnerability in its various forms is important. And the first step to being able to protect vulnerable people is that ability uh, to recognise the vulnerability of the people or beneficiaries. Yeah, and, and look, this, this is important. I mean, people sort of look at an, the idea of, of vulnerable people or beneficiaries and, and that they might sway towards perhaps um, a, a situation where that vulnerability might be one that's that's ongoing, but to remember that there can be vulnerability that is temporary or, or is one that is in a certain situation uh, or a certain set of circumstances is is a very important thing for charities to be um, to be mindful of, I, I suppose. Um, so. And, and, and I know that you've you've sort of touched on this, Ian, um, in in talking about charities that might be working uh, overseas or, or with uh, third parties partners overseas. Some charities, simply by what they do, might have more contact with vulnerable beneficiaries. Um, and as I said, due to the nature of their work or, or who they work with, um, this adds, I guess, a greater significance to the responsibilities and and that they have and. I guess, a greater significance to what they might have to think about when it comes to um, addressing these issues. Um, now, among the responsibilities that charities have are the standards that they have to uh, adhere with uh, or comply with that the ACNC has in place. Um, if we just wanted to, Julia and Ian, have, a, I guess, a quick summary of where of where safeguarding um, fits into some of the standards that the, the ACNC has in place, which are the governance standards, but also the external conduct standards. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, look, the ACNC governance standards don't specifically refer to safeguarding, but what they do do is make it clear that charities need to comply with the law and that charities' responsible people have a duty to act with care and diligence 
diligence and in the best interest of the charity. Yeah. So if yeah. you're going to act with care and diligence and in the best interests of the charity, you need to turn your mind to and take your, and take steps to protect vulnerable people. It's a, it's a really vital part of your duties and it's covered by those standards. Yeah, yeah, it falls very squarely under the duties uh, that responsible people have, don't, isn't yeah. it? It's not just it's not specifically mentioned, but it's very clear that it's part of what what we, what they should be doing. Correct. Yes, that's yeah. right. But when it comes to um, charities that work overseas, even those charities that just send funds overseas, there's, a, there's other standards and they're called the external conduct standards. Yep. They have explicit statements and requirements sound, surrounding the protection of vulnerable people. Um, charities that operate over, overseas have to ex adhere to the external conduct standards and the ECS, uh, well, ECS, the external conduct standard, sorry for the abbreviation there, um, have, ex well, have explicit they're, they're, requirements for protecting vulnerable people. So they specifically state the words protect vulnerable people and they are listed in external conduct standard four. Um, if you want to look it up, there's some great information on our website as well about um, external conduct standard four but I'll talk a little bit more about it and what's required. External Conduct Standard 4 requires a charity to take reasonable steps to ensure the safety of vulnerable individuals overseas. So we don't prescribe what reasonable steps are. Your charity needs to decide based on its own circumstances. And we'll give you some information today that will help you to decide those things but it means considering the risks and considering things like the risks associated with the location you operated in your size the expertise of the staff that um, provide services on behalf of your you or your partners overseas the complexity of the operations the cultural issues at play or your work with third parties there's there's more examples on our website Pay special attention to high risk activities linked to children and vulnerable people, such as overseas volunteering and child sponsorship. They come with, they come with additional risks. This standard applies to activities you provide and, and activities you engage others to provide. With this too, I mean, we, we, when we say take reasonable steps, I mean, it's, it's very clear that you know, we, we, you can't lump all charities into the one basket. It's not, this is not a one size fits all thing. And I guess this is a, a important, um, important point to note as we, as we go through this webinar that um, for, for responsible people, there, there's a bit of, there's a bit of responsibility. There's a bit of judgment when it comes to what reasonable steps for your organisation might be, because quite simply, yeah, one size does not fit all. So be very aware that it is up to charities, their responsible people, to know what reasonable might mean and to ensure that reasonable steps are, are actually taken. Um, what, one other thing to remember, and as the slide here uh, puts forward, beyond governance standards, beyond external conduct standards, there might be other laws, state, federal, even overseas legislation um, that you're charity has to has to comply with again it's important for charities and their responsible people to understand uh, what are the legal obligations uh, they might have uh, and to consider it when when uh, working to protect you know young people and, and vulnerable beneficiaries um, that's a bit of context and a bit of introduction what we'll what we'll do now is we'll we'll jump into I guess the the nitty-gritty of things uh, in that we're going to look at some of the issues, look at managing the risks. Um, we're going to go almost step by step through some of the important considerations that that, that uh, surround this issue, I suppose. Um, we do have, and I'll mention it now, a broader governance toolkit, um, which is uh, able to be uh, accessed on our site, acnc.gov.au forward slash governance toolkit. Um, that focuses on protecting vulnerable people um, uh, 
uh, and young, well, sorry, part of it focuses on protecting vulnerable people and young people. Um, and that part of it is acnc.gov.au forward slash safeguarding. So there's a wider resource that looks at um, governance overall, and there's a specific resource that looks at safeguarding. Um, resource uh, has a number of downloads, some of which we've included as handouts today with the, with the webinar. Um, there's uh, checklists, there's other bits and pieces that will help you, um, I guess you use them as a basis uh, for, for your own charity's work. Um, look, what we'll do, we'll dive in. Um, and to start with, we've got a bit of a case study, haven't we, uh, guys? Um, what, what, what are we looking at here in this case study or example? Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, let's let, let's have a look at an example of a charity that advocates for the mental health and well-being of, of children. Um, so this particular charity, to achieve their purpose, they conduct a number of activities, which includes uh, running seminars and workshops for school-aged children. So now we, we haven't yet discussed the steps charities should take to ensure they have strong governance to safeguard vulnerable beneficiaries. But when you think about the activities that this charity undertakes, you can appreciate the need to have policies and processes to guide decision making and to mitigate risks that could occur in an environment where the charity's responsible people, their employees or volunteers are interacting with school aged children. Um, so when charities are safeguarding vulnerable people or beneficiaries, an important first step is identifying the risks. And for this charity, uh, running workshops with school-aged children, it would be important to strategically identify the risks so that it can be well-placed to respond and safeguard its vulnerable beneficiaries. So as per the next slide, let's look at how charities can do this in a bit more detail. The first thing to look at here is identifying and assessing the risks. Uh, your charity needs to firstly understand the risks, it needs to understand its obligations and also determine the policies, procedures and systems it needs to manage both. And we're, we're talking here, and, and we preempt this at the, on the slide here on the screen, we're, we're talking here that this is sort of a, a step towards developing a, a, a risk assessment, I suppose, isn't it, Anne? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and as we've noted already, the idea of, of a risk assessment needs to be um, tailored to the circumstances and size of the charity. But yeah, we would see it as, as being uh, an essential first step for a charity that are involved with uh, or have activities that involve uh, vulnerable beneficiaries to undertake a risk assessment. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. A risk assessment is a process that will help to identify the risks that come with your charity's work with people, prioritise each risk according to its likelihood and consequences, and also identify the policies, procedures and systems that the charity will need to deal with the risks. Yeah. You could, conduct, you could conduct the risk assessment for the organisation, different departments of the charity or organisation, or different programs. Yeah. And this would be a good point to discuss the tools and resources that are available to support charities. You've already mentioned some of them yourself, Chris. Yeah. On, the ACNC, on the ACNC website, um, we have the governance toolkit, which you referenced, um, with a specific section that focuses on safeguarding. And there are other resources available also. In particular, the National Office of Child Safety has resources available to support child safe organisations, including an introductory self-assessment tool that's aligned with the national principles for child safe organisations. This would be a great starting point for charities that are looking to enhance or review their safeguarding governance. Um, and it would be a really good uh, lead in for charities who are thinking, where do I start uh, if I need to enhance or review my safeguarding governance? So looking at the risk assessment framework, um, some things that the charities should think about. Um, yeah. We can have a look at the things such as the people the charity affects or works with, mm. how common the types of incidents are that, that impact the charity, and the consequences an incident might produce. Um, you can think about potential uh, impacts on a charity's reputation, its partners and staff morale, as well as uh, the impact of incidents on victims, the charity itself and its beneficiaries. So moving on to the next slide, I'll hand over to my colleague, Julia, um, who is going to focus on the policies that charities can implement for safeguarding. Definitely. 
Ah, okay. Well, um, so we're looking, we're looking here, aren't we? Yeah. It's, here we are. We've, we've, we've. I've missed a slide. I do apologise. Um, so these are just looking at some of the bits and pieces that should be considered as part of a, a, a safeguarding policy. What, what have we got here? What have we got here, Julia? Um, well, uh, a policy that outlines your, oh yeah, outlines your charity's approach to safeguarding um, yeah. should reference your charity's legal obligations. So as Chris mentioned earlier, there may be our legislative obligations, but you may also have obligations to other state or national regulators yeah. um, or funding bodies. There could be other people that you do. So, so reference those, outline the identified risks, hmm. define the key terms, for example, safeguarding and vulnerable person. Clearly state your charity's expectations of staff, volunteers and partners and outline your charity's processes for managing risks. So you know how you're going to manage your risks. Yeah. It's and important there's a few more. I'll, I'll flip to that. the next slide. <laughs> Sorry about that, Julia. There's a few more, few more here if you wanted to go through. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, thanks. Identify who's responsible for managing the safeguarding, so who within your organisation. Um, clearly define the roles and responsibilities of people involved in safeguarding. So there may be one or two people or a particular way that a concern is reported and people know how to do it. Extend obligations to your charity's partners and contractors. Contain supporting resources such as an incident response plan or an employee vetting document and be endorsed by your charity's board. Yeah. It's important to ensure that the policy is observed and implemented. So sometimes um, charities can have policies, uh, however, people within the organisation might not be aware of them and they might not be implemented. So the implementation is a really important step. There, there, there was one point there too that, that, and we'll probably highlight this too as we go through that, yeah, extend obligation to obligations to your charities, partners and contractors. Again, we particularly have, uh, I guess, you know, reference to this if you are working with overseas partners, if you're working with contractors yeah. overseas, you, you need to ensure as a charity that if you are working with a third party, as we call them, that this safeguarding policy that you have in place, the end of it is not the end of where your charity is. The end of it is encompassing of operations that may include a third party, may include a partner or a contractor. So um, be very aware of that. And, and probably what that's going to mean is, is that if you're got a safeguard and your partner or contractor might already have uh, a policy or, or procedures in place, um, you will probably need to talk to them as well. That would probably be a very smart step forward. Uh, to ensure that you're all, all on the same page and, and that the um, any policies that are in place, you know, uh, encompass everyone that they should. So that was just one I wanted to, I guess, prioritise a one that I'll um, I'll, I'll, I'll call out. Um, again, our governance toolkit the, and the safeguarding resources it's got, and I'll, I'll flick it back on, um, it's got a template uh, of a safeguarding policy and your charity can can grab a hold of that and perhaps adapt it for its own own circumstances. Um, it's a good starting point. Uh, another good starting point, I suppose, um, for charities that are looking to develop and strengthen their safeguarding governance. So again, go and have a look at at the uh, at the safeguarding uh, stuff that we've got on our site. Um, it is also a handout again in our um, in our uh, in our go to webinar uh, sort of control panel um, interface here. So go and download it if you wish. And the uh, oh sorry the resource that you mentioned earlier on Ian um, we'll throw a link of that or a link to that into our follow up email as well so people will be able to easily um, click on that and follow it and be able to have a look at those resources too um, now one other thing that's important here is that while you have a policy as a charity you can't just have a policy and not commit to it. As, as I know you, you mentioned, Julia, you've got to have resources. You've got to have um, uh, the ability to step up and say, yeah, we, we have a policy, we now want to commit to it. 
you have to also ensure that there's leadership um, on this policy and that everyone in your charity um, shares, its, shares the commitment to it uh, and what it covers as well. Um, now we've got internal, we're looking at internal controls here. Julia, um, what, what, what are we talking about when we talk about internal controls? Yeah, thanks Chris. What we're talking about um, again with internal controls is, is having and implementing the right policies, procedures and systems which allows, um, it's, it's an, they can serve as an early warning to allow a charity to stop an incident or help in that instance, um, as well as they can mitigate or reduce the consequences of an incident if it actually does occur. Um, so we call these policy systems and procedures internal controls and it's important they're appropriate for your charity and they address your specific risks. Yeah. What are some yeah. examples of these things? Yeah, yeah. thanks. I was, I was just about to go in. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> um, some examples of internal controls include um, due, due diligence checks, so background checks on your staff. Um, segregating duties and providing supervision. So, for example, in high-risk situations, you may uh, they might be shared by two people, so they can assist each other and reduce risk. Um, managing third parties, that means making sure your partners are capable of and committed to protecting people in their work and that appropriate agreements are in place. Yeah. So those agreements, and the communication with people um, help serve as, as internal controls. A code of conduct for staff uh, can also help prevent harm and mitigate risk because every, everyone's then aware of the behaviours that they're expected to exhibit in the workplace. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, having these type of controls in place, now it's not of very much use, if they're not adhered to. Um, what, what are some of the ways that we, we can look at here to ensure that they are adhered to? What, what are, you know, what are, I guess, charities uh, abilities or, or what should they be looking at to ensure that the, uh, that the, the, um, the policies and, and, and everything that's in place uh, is known and, and, and is, is stuck to, I suppose? Some of the things um, to, that a charity can do to ensure um, that is um, communicate, communicate your expectations and raise awareness of the issue through formal channels, so policies, which we've talked a lot about, procedures, training resources, um, or less formal methods um, to communicate with your staff, like email updates, newsletters, staff meetings where the topic of safeguarding is discussed, yeah. policies and procedures are talked about and people are informed um, about the charity's expectations. Um, develop and maintain a culture that values safeguarding. So it's something that's quite alive within your organ your charity. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, go into a case study now, that's right, and helpfully um, about a charity, a small charity that operates overseas. And as we've talked about, the risk and what steps um, you would be required to take depend on your own size and circumstance and um, the activities that you provide. Uh, so, um, we'll look at a, a case study that focuses on a charity's obligations as they are laid out in External Conduct Standard 4. Yep. Um, that's because charities that operate overseas uh, are subject to the External Conduct Standards, if we, as we've already discussed, um, and they often um, can rely on programs to be delivered be delivered by overseas partners or third parties. So you may send funds or have an agreement with someone overseas to provide services on your behalf. Um, this means that communicating and buy-in becomes even more, more vital. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 
So for example, say you're a small charity that fundraises to support um, offshore programs that provide support for disadvantaged children, including education and food programs. Um, you're working with a partner offshore that runs the program. What we might view as reasonable context um, governance in that context is Thinking of some practical things you could do would be, you know, understanding and documenting what the risks might be for your charity in that context. Yeah. Thinking that the partner has adequate safeguarding measures in place, ask the questions of them, what mm -hmm. do they do, and document ev any evidence. Um, check the reputation of the organisation that you're working with. Um, are they registered in the country they're operating to deliver the services that you're, you're getting them to provide? Perhaps ask them for and keep a copy uh, of their registration certificate. Find out about their staffing and volunteer recruitment processes and their ability to safely deliver the programs that you're supporting. Um, have information yeah, ask them for information about how their staff are screened and perhaps some evidence that this occurs so that you know who is, who is providing those services. Have a written agreement that outlines your expectations and the obligations of each organisation when it comes to safeguarding. Makes it quite clear and you've got something to rely on. Um, be aware of the complaints process your partner has regarding vulnerable beneficiaries and that and that they and beneficiaries can raise issues and know how they'll be dealt with by that organization so that's just um, some examples hopefully a bit more concrete uh, related to a small charity that sends funds overseas there are more examples available on our website as well now i know you just sort of touched on this julia the um the uh, the awareness side of things, the uh, but also the um, I guess the confidence or the assurance that uh, charities people might have when it comes to um, you know re reporting a concern or, or an incident. Um, what are I guess I'll, I'll, re I'll address this one to you, Ian. What are some of the the ways that a charity can ensure that its people are confident in following through, confident in raising issues, that sort of thing. What, what are some of the keys here? Yeah, thanks Chris. Yeah, detecting and reporting issues is a very important practice um, and kind of complements the, the policies and procedures uh, that, that Julia just ran through there as well. So it needs to be the complete package. So there are things that a charity can do to detect changes in risk, instances of harm and non-compliance with obligations. It includes making sure that there are ways for people to provide feedback, raise grievances and report issues, and also people who report concerns or incidents of harm are protected. Yeah. So when we talk about protecting people who report, who raise a concern, who, who come to the charity and say, I've got a bit of an issue here, um, we're talking about issues in relation to things like you know confidentiality or, or anonymity, aren't we, Ian? Yeah, that's right. Um, and this illustrates the importance of charities, uh, the, the charities people having confidence in the measures that are in place, their staff and volunteers, for example. Uh, charities should ensure that there is a clear and transparent system for investigating and responding to concerns. And also, um, they might consider training staff in safeguarding so that they can identify inc incidences and know how to respond. Yeah, yeah. What, what would when we have a look uh, at the next uh, slide um, we when we're taking action when there are concerns and when an issue is raised the charity of course has to take action to understand what happens what risks there are uh, to protect the people that are involved there's a template we've referenced the template a few times but I really do encourage charities to think about accessing our resources to support their government so there's a template available on our website um, you've, you've mentioned the location once before, but I'll reiterate it. It's <laughs> at atnc.gov.au forward slash safeguarding. Yeah. Um, it can help charities to develop an incident response plan and it will guide charities through the steps they need to consider. So let's look at those steps in detail 
it helps to have a plan in place to guide the charity's response. And the charity should think about who is responsible for responding, what's required, and when matters should be reported to an external party. And that last part is probably a very important point. Um, you know, we talk about the importance of having governance for the ACNC, but there are legal obligations in place that require charities to have mandatory reporting when certain incidents occur. Um, and we would certainly, we've referenced that a little bit earlier in the webinar, but charities really do need, as part of their planning and risk assessment, to ensure of, of what those legal obligations are. And there's also, um, I'll make mention here, there's also a, um, through again, our, our safeguarding page on our website, there's an incident response plan template. Um, that'll help charities um, and guide them through some of the steps that they might need to consider. Um, again, it's also available as a handout today for, for those of you with us. So you can uh, you can download it if you miss out on doing that. Go to our go to our website and, and have a look um, and 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 download that amongst the other resources that we we might have. Um, when it when we sort of get into talking about plans and 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 procedures and things like that, um, now. They can't be static. They 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 can't just be a point in time type thing. They they have to be living documents and they have to be constantly reviewed and they have to be updated. Um, and if you want to do maybe mention a few of the things and you can see a couple on screen here when it comes to reviewing and looking over a plan that a charity might have in place in this area. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So. Um to help with this task, charities can timetable regular reviews of safeguarding policies, procedures and systems. That's one uh, thing that they can implement. Charities can also look at reviewing uh, their policies and procedures after any incident to ensure that lessons learned are incorporated back into the process. So during the review process, checks that the current work, checks such as um, looking at the current working environment, legislation and regulation, they can be included. Also, the charity can evaluate whether the people and partners, staff and volunteers included, are following the policies and procedures properly. Charities should ask this question, do their policies and procedures work? Yeah. I'd like at this point to, to share uh, a little three-word slogan that I came across that's used by a charity. Um, it, it's, it's made a lasting impression on me and I think it really reflects well the idea to re continually review on an ongoing basis the safeguarding governance you have in place. The slogan is um, commitment, compliance and complacency. Um, the idea is to achieve compliance, but in order to do this, you have to have commitment. Yeah. But the charity also, importantly, needs to avoid complacency uh, to ensure that it doesn't become too comfortable and fails to address the risk. So, yeah, something a little bit unique. You know, you often don't think about having complacency as part of a, a charity slogan to, to have really strong safeguarding, but I think it really reflects that point about the danger by becoming too comfortable and not reviewing or considering what needs to be updated in your safeguarding governance. Yeah. And some, something that worked six months ago, three months ago, 12 months ago, it might not work now. It might not be relevant now. So you definitely have to review and you definitely have to, as it says here, schedule regular reviews. Um, and, and when you learn lessons, feed them back. Um, and, and, and gather them and ensure that what you're doing improves through the lessons that you learn. Um, now, I'm going to flick over. I reckon we've got another case study here. So um, what I might do, and I might leave you with this case study if you wanted to um, to share it, explain it and, uh, and go through it. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think this is a, a good chance to wrap up all the steps that we've kind of gone through uh, that charities can take to develop strong governance in terms of safeguarding. Uh, this is our third and final case study. Yep. Um, so this looks at a registered charity that advocates for carers of family members with disability. Um, so we've looked at case studies that focus on vulnerable beneficiaries being children, but remember that the definition of vulnerable beneficiaries is broader, and this case study is a reminder of this. We often encounter charities in the ACNC compliance team that undertake activities that aren't closely aligned with vulnerable beneficiaries, but their activities nonetheless has potential for the charity to interact with vulnerable beneficiaries. And it's important that these charities have reasonable governance in place to safeguard the vulnerable people, people they could interact with. So this charity, as part of this case study, while its principal focus is on advocacy of carers, 
Uh, the charity should identify and, assay and assess the safeguarding risks. It should put in place policies and, and uh, to guide its decision making. It should engage people and build a safeguarding culture and also have in place procedures to report incidents and review its governance. And, and a final point, the ACNC appreciates the challenges faced by charities uh, to have resources that they need to deliver their purpose. And we don't expect all charities to have a dedicated staff member whose only role is a governance and risk coordinator. We understand that there are small charities who have different circumstances that need to be addressed. So charities should implement governance that's reasonable for their size and circumstances. And remember that there are tools available to support them on their journey to effective governance. Yeah, and, and not only are those tools available from our site, there, there are plenty of tools available around, around the web. Um, again, we'll link to a few of them um, in our, in our follow-up email. Also on the safeguarding page itself, if my memory serves, there's I think probably 10 different links down the bottom of the page to various resources and, and uh, websites um, ranging from um, uh, not-for-profits and charities to um, I think there's some legal stuff in there. There's also some other government department stuff in there as well. So um, definitely make use of the resources that are there, access them and and uh, use them as reference points for, for the work that, that your charity will need to do in this area, I suppose. Um, with the end of that case study, we're getting near the end of things at our end here. What we might do, we might just wrap up with five or six um, key points just to reiterate a couple of things that we've, we've talked about throughout today's, uh, today's session. Um, and the first couple here are on screen. Again, going right back to the start, safeguarding is a, a I guess, a very, uh, a very important thing, obviously, but it is a primary part of a charity's duty of care. So that's the first one to remember. Um, ACNC obligations, uh, there are both implicit and explicit responsibilities for charities when it comes to uh, protecting young people, vulnerable beneficiaries. Um, Again, most explicitly, they go through external conduct standard four, but as we discussed uh, earlier on, the governance standards are very clear in, in how they uh, put forward the roles and responsibilities that, that responsible people uh, have. So they're, they're the first two. Um, Julia, uh, what, are the, what are the next two? Yeah, the next two um, are, it's important to remember that a risk assessment isn't just about identifying possible risks, but seeing which ones are most likely to impact your charity, yeah. and then looking at how you can deal with them, what systems or internal controls are needed. And of course, good policy isn't the only component. Communication and leadership help develop a charity culture that values safeguarding. Yeah, and the last couple. Um, charities need to ensure that, that any concerns that might be expressed by their, their people or, or people from a, a partner, for example, that they can be re they're reported um, anonymously. Um, and that, that there's also a clear system to investigate these, these, uh, these incidents as well, because if that system is clear, then there's confidence. Um, and it's important that obviously, if, if you want this this whole thing to work, that there's confidence in the system that, that you have in, that a charity has in place. Um, the, the last one here is, and we've, we've, we've spoken about this a few times, the, the need for regular reviews um, and, and a, an attitude towards review and improvement, um, I suppose. Uh, your, your reviews should be undertaken with a view to improve what you have, to build on what you have. Um, to take on board any lessons that, that you, that the charity or charity and partners might have learned, to then have them flow into or, or incorporate them in the in the systems you have. So that's that's the the last thing to remember here. Um, now I'm just having a look at the clock. We've got a few minutes, so we won't hold you up beyond our, our scheduled time. Um, we've gotten some questions, and there was one that's that's come through that um, I thought I might put to both Julia and to Ian here. Um, one charity has asked us how they can 
engage their staff and volunteers. Now we've gone through some points and some some ways and methods of doing it. From your perspectives, what are do you believe maybe the the one or two um, absolute key ways that that this can be done? The one or two key ways that a charity can engage staff and volunteers in in this area. Yeah, I'm happy to field that question. I, I think the, the number one thing I would suggest is um, giving staff and volunteers a voice, actually listening to them and then giving them ownership um, of, of the matter so that they can actually provide their, their thoughts. And something that I reflect on um, as I've been to different seminars and, and meetings regarding safeguarding is um, when, when you think about the National Office of Child Safety and, and the National Principles for Child Safety, they're very strong on advocating for the voice of children and young people. Yeah. So it's not just about the responsible people in the board sitting in isolation and thinking about what's in the best interest of the charity. Of course, we want them to do that, but they do need to engage their staff and volunteers and beneficiaries uh, to ensure that the safeguarding governance they have in place is, is effective and supports the charity. Yeah. The other thing I'd say on top of that in terms of having a, a good safeguarding culture um, the National Office of Child Safety, I think, have some resources available. Think simple as posters and those kind of things. Put it up in the office. Um, you know, a great reminder of the need to have child safety and safeguarding is to actually have those visual prompts that actually kind of embed and kind of remind staff of the need to have uh, good governance around safeguarding. Like everyone, we can get focused on, you know, the number one priority and I'm sure that charities are busy at different times with natural disasters and those kind of things, um, fulfilling their charitable purpose. But having those visual prompts, uh, I think is really good to actually remind staff. Another way you could have a prompt is to have it as a standing item uh, on, a, on a, board, uh, a board agenda. And uh, I guess too, when we, we talk about get, you know, getting, getting the word out, sorry to use that phrase, but if you've got a, a third party, if you've got a partner, a, again, the idea of communication, but also the idea of ensuring that both parties sit down and, and talk about these things. And um, you mentioned Ian about giving voice to people, but giving voice to, to both organisations and, and the you know, communicating about maybe the challenges that, that the partner might face if they're doing some of the on-ground work, for example. Um, that, that's something that's very important as well to ensure that there's a, a wide sort of, um, I guess, scope of, of uh, knowledge um, that you can get fed back into any work that you, that you need to do. Um, look, what we'll do, we might, we might wrap things up there um, because it's lunchtime or morning tea time, depending on where you are uh, around Australia at the moment. Um, we've got a few ways that people can stay in touch with us and here they are on the screen. Um, there's obviously through the website, um, social media, uh, our, our podcasts. We've got a new podcast episode just, uh, just up too, so go check that out. Um, our charitable purpose, um, sign up and, and receive that. Um, go and have a look at some of these, these bits and pieces. Um, beyond that, thank you very much for coming along today. Um, feel free to join us for webinars coming up in the future uh, or to access previous webinars at the address there. Um, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Julia, for, for joining us today. Thanks, heaps. Thanks, Chris. No problem. Thanks, Chris. Cool. Um, and Beyond that, thank you to Matt. Thank you to Gus for um, answering questions, for typing away madly in the in the background and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our presentation today. You got plenty out of it. If you've got any feedback, please fill in the survey once we're done here. If you've got any further questions that you might have, uh, education at acnc.gov.au. Um, we look forward to you joining us again very soon. Uh, have a great day, everyone. See you later. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.